I wasn't quite sure what to prepare for today. Um, I did present the tool yesterday. Can you hear me on the mic? Um, <clears throat> I presented the uh, virtual math teams tool, VMT, uh, yesterday. And tomorrow in the data session, we'll be analyzing the results of some students using this tool to see the collaborative learning that took place. So today I was asked to do something about the didactics of our approach to mathematics education. And so that's what I uh, focus on on the slides, but we can discuss other things if whatever's of interest to people here. <clears throat> um, so what I prepared is to go over these nine points here. Uh, first, to talk about construction in GeoGebra. Um, have you used GeoGebra? Are you familiar with it? So everybody's familiar with it. That's good. Um, and my focus in developing the curriculum, and I have uh, developed a workbook here that has uh, a curriculum in it and also tutorials in how to use the system. So you can download uh, this. You're welcome to do that <coughs> for details. But my focus has been on what I consider dependencies uh, in geometry. And that's what I want to get across in the lessons to students on geometry. So, um, and I think that custom tools are a good tool for that within GeoGebra uh, to um, abstract these dependencies. And the fo my focus is on construction, use of custom tools, and building that up to uh, being able to prove propositions based on understanding of the dependencies in a geometric construction. And I'll explain what I call creative discovery as a human-centered approach to geometry, in contrast to thinking of geometry as sort of eternal truths from some other world, ideal world. Um, and, then, and then I want to talk briefly about how we teach math teachers and their students uh, what our curriculum is for those groups, and then how we analyze that. So, um, um, geometry education's been around for thousands of years, and I talked yesterday about how it's changed over those years, how it's still changing, uh, even from month to month as GeoGebra develops and as people's approach to teaching with GeoGebra changes. But the main features of GeoGebra, as, as you know, or of, of any dynamic geometry system, are dragging, construction, and dependencies. Um, so dynamic geometry, whether it's using Geometer Sketchpad, Cabri, or Ge GeoGebra, or other systems, um, presents a new form of ge geometry that's in some ways different from uh, Euclidean geometry or, or Cartesian analytic geometry, um, but provides a continuity historically with them. Um, <clears throat> so with, with these uh, three features of dynamic geometry, students can drag figures around to discover the dependencies that exist within the figures, and then they can design to create their own figures that have similar or the same dependencies. And it's this combination of discovery and creation which are supported in a special way in, in dynamic geometry that allow, allows for approach that I consider a human-centered, where the students are doing active discovery and active creation of geometric objects. This is a just an, a screenshot of GeoGebra in, um, on the iPad, which has come out recently. So you see you can uh, construct figures, and it also lists the, um, the objects that are part of 
the figure. So um, dynamic geometry has a, a potential for a new approach to geometry education. And uh, this is the research question that my research agenda poses. How can geometry education be structured to incorporate the orientation to the social construction of geometric knowledge, where a, a small groups of students are involved in actually uh, socially constructing the knowledge through this combination of creation and discovery within, within a setting of collaborative learning. And so I've developed, or my research group has developed, this virtual math teams, or VMT technology, and curriculum, the curriculum in the in the topics workbook that builds on this emphasis on discourse and collaboration uh, and supports it, embedding in a, in a multi-user geogebra in a collaborative learning environment. And uh, this is a screenshot of the virtual math team's uh, software, which consists primarily of a a tab with GeoGebra and a chat interface. So a small group of students will, can be together in this chat room. They can chat about what they're doing and they can do constructions and there can be uh, curriculum text which guides them to do the work. And there are a number of features built into the software um, such as a, a history slider, so they can go back in the history of this construction and see how it was put together over time by the group. And they can reference from the chat, from a new, their new chat posting, to an old chat posting or to an object in the uh, GeoGebra area. Uh, furthermore, the GeoGebra is multi-user. So that means that a number of students uh, share that construction and can take part in um, doing the construction. They can take turns taking control of the GeoGebra tools. And they all see the same thing. So it's not like they're sitting at their own computer with their own diagram of GeoGebra, but they're sharing the same uh, instance of GeoGebra uh, environment. And furthermore, uh, within this chat room there can be several tabs, each with their own GeoGebra environment. So you can have several lessons in GeoGebra in the one chat room and, and students can move from one tab to the other um, and work on them consecutively. So um, geometric objects are constructed um, from elementary, elementary objects like points and lines. And the curriculum that I've developed tries to step students through understanding how, um, <clears throat> how, how uh, the points are the most basic. So you start by being able to create points and to drag them around. So a point is just a location anywhere on the surface. And you can move the free points around. And, and if you take a pair of points like A and B, they define a line that goes through them. That's a basic idea from Euclid, the two points define a line, and the line continues indefinitely in either direction. And then you can have segments that just go from one point to the other. They're just like a line, but they have endpoints. Or a ray has uh, one in one direction, it continues indefinitely, and the other, it has a, um, an endpoint. 
but uh, a, so a line is, is just uh, a locus of all the points along a, along a straight line. So a line is defined by points. So points are, are the beginning, um, are the starting point, but lines are built from points, and then circles and polygons are built from, uh, from, from lines and points. So a circle is the locus of all the points a certain distance from the center point. So it's defined and built up from the idea of points and lines. A polygon is just a series of line segments that are connected. And so the, uh, the curriculum tries to step students through understanding those relations and how they're, they're built on one another. And then there's the concept of dependencies. So to begin with, points are free to be moved anywhere. And as you move the point, of course, the line that's defined by it moves too. But in addition, you can have points that are constrained to be on. So this point H is constrained to be on uh, line segment DE. It can move anywhere along the segment, but it can't move beyond the segment or off of it in any direction. So we call that point constrained. So points. Um, D, E, F, and G are free to move anywhere, but H is constrained to move that way. And then you can have dependent points, such as the point I, which is at the intersection of the two line segments. It can't be dragged at all, but it moves if you move one of the lines or one of the points. So the position of point I is defined as being dependent upon uh, the positions of the other points that define the intersecting lines. And so uh, in GeoGebra, they're even colored differently. So a dependent point is colored black, a free point is a dark blue, and a constrained point is a, is a lighter blue. And these are things that the students notice as they're working on this. So at this point, we've defined the basic um, elements of geometry and also the basic idea of dependent points and constrained points. And so we've built up um, the system of geometry starting from basic points. And, uh, and the idea that you can move, move points around is, uh, is um, a difference from traditional Euclidean geometry, where once you draw a point, it stays there. But in traditional Euclidean geometry, you talk about a point representing any point on the, on the plane. And you call it an arbitrary point, or you say for any point on the plane. And in dynamic geometry, you can drag it to be any point, literally, on the plane. So it's a natural extension of Euclidean geometry. And all the constructed relationships that are important to proofs are maintained under the dragging. So if a point is dragged, all the lines and so polygons and so on that are constructed with that are dynamically recalculated by the software so that they're maintained uh, with the dragging. And all dependency relations are maintained. So if we look um, at a figure like, like this, which is basically a, um, an equilateral triangle through points A, B, and C, it's constructed using Euclid's method in, his in the very first proposition in Euclid's book. Um, <clears throat> but now it can be dragged around. The whole thing can be dragged around. But as it's dragged, um, things change, like the lengths of the sides change. But the lengths are always equal. It remains an equilateral triangle because of the construction that created it. <clears throat> uh, and then this little triangle here remains 
an isosceles triangle with these two sides equal, <coughs> no matter how you drag things around. Um, and then GeoGebra has um, this display which shows the location of the points and the equation of the lines and circles and, and the areas of polygons. And you see here, uh, it differentiates in GeoGebra between free objects and dependent objects. So the concept of dependency is absolutely central to GeoGebra. And it even uh, shows it to the user here that points A and B can be moved however you want them to be, to be moved around. Um, and, and you see when point A is moved, the values of um, its location are changed, but also a lot of the other values are changed because those values are dependent upon A. So the software recalculates all of those dependent objects and relationships. <clears throat> and it understands that all of these things are dependent upon the location of A and B. So this notion of dependency is, is as I say, uh, absolutely central to the software or to the nature of dynamic geometry in, in some distinction to traditional uh, Euclidean geometry. And so um, in my curriculum, I try to get that point across to students so they start to notice these dependency relationships. So if you, look at, um, if you look at Euclid's original um, propositions, you can start to see them, how they translate into dynamic geometry as construction methods. So he has, uh, his first proposition is the proof that, uh, that this, that this uh, triangle is equilateral. And it's not just equilateral the way it's drawn right there, but also if you drag it, and it's because of how it's constructed. So instead of reading it as a proof that this particular triangle is equilateral, you can read it as a method of construction for constructing a dynamic equilateral triangle. And, and it works perfectly as, as directions for constructing it, an equilateral triangle in dynamic geometry. And if you understand that it was constructed by <clears throat> constructing two circles whose, whose radius is, a, is the length AB for both circles, and you understand that all radii of a certain size circle are equal, then the proof that these three sides, which are all of length, radius of the circle, uh, also length AB, which is the radius of both circles. Um, the proof is, just falls out naturally from the construction with, with that understanding. So by understanding the dependencies that are constructed into that figure, um, you understand the proof almost, uh, almost automatically from that. Then if you look at Euclid's second proposition, um, <clears throat> it's a, a bit more complicated. You're given, um, uh, I think you're given, uh, segment BC, and you want to copy that length to start at point, some point A. So uh, he goes through this complicated many-step uh, construction to copy this length over to here. And um, 
So while it's called a proposition, it's really a detailed description of a construction procedure for copying one length, a, a segment of a certain length to a segment of the identical length uh, some, located somewhere else. Now, uh, and it uses the, the method, construction method uses the construction of an equilateral triangle from proposition one. So it builds, proposition two builds on proposition one as a construction method. So rather than thinking of these things as proofs of theorems, we can think of them as, when applied to dynamic geometry, as construction methods that maintain certain dependencies, namely the dependency of this length upon this length. And if we drag, if we drag um, and change the length BC, you see that also this length AI that we've constructed changes as well. So it goes down to zero and gets very big and so on. So you see that the dep dependency is maintained through dynamic dragging. And actually, the first uh, several, several of the first propositions in, um, in Euclid are really nothing more than construction methods for constructing things with certain dependencies. And so um, even though dynamic geometry looks to be quite a bit different from Euclidean geometry and uses the power of computers to recalculate things and maintain dependencies and so on, it's really a fairly straight um, translation of, of Euclid's construction methods in these different propositions to, uh, to the dynamic version in uh, dynamic geometry. And so, <clears throat> um, GeoGebra consists, you can think of GeoGebra and its tools as being three sets of tools. There are the tools to construct the, uh, the basic objects of geometry, namely points, lines, uh, circles, polygons. A second set to, to construct figures that are dependent objects, like perpendicular lines, equilateral triangles, and various kinds of centers of triangles, which are all dependent. For instance, a, a center of a triangle, like an incenter or circumcenter, and so, so on are dependent on the three vertices of the triangle. And as you move the vertices, as you drag them, the centers change. And this, this set of tools constructs those dependent objects. Uh, and then there's uh, a set of tools just to change the interface appearance, like zooming tools or changing colors of lines and so on. So the first set, Presents, provides the primitive objects of GeoGebra, which correspond pretty much to Euclid's definitions and postulates on the first page of his book. And the second set abstracts these constructions that he's built in his other propositions, um, like how to construct an equilateral triangle or copy a segment length, uh, bisect an angle, create a midpoint, and so on. Uh, and then it has these other uh, tools which are of less uh, mathematical consequence. Um, so here's his construction of uh, perpendicular bisector. Um, so GeoGebra also provides what it calls custom tools and uh, in theory anyway, users could construct um, that whole set of, the second set of tools like 
uh, a tool to create an equilateral triangle, a tool to create a right triangle, a tool to create a perpendicular bisector, uh, a tool to bisect an angle, a tool to, to construct an incenter of a triangle, and so on. Those can all be constructed by the students using uh, the basic set of primitive tools from the first set. So, um, although a lot of these tools are provided by GeoGebra, uh, the students could create their own version and thereby understand how those tools are designed and what dependencies are built into them. <clears throat> so, they can build tools that correspond to Euclid's various propositions. Um, and then they could either even build, create their own geometry, geometries, their own versions of geometry um, by having their own set of custom tools. So they could become very creative by using this idea of custom tools. Uh, but the main thing with the custom tools, I think, is to give the students a better understanding of the dependencies that are hidden in the tools, in a way. So if you use a tool that constructs a perpendicular and you don't know how to construct the perpendicular yourself, then um, you're missing understanding something that may be important, uh, for instance, in, in developing a proof. Um, and so often uh, these, these dependencies which are important to understand in geometry are hidden either behind a terminology or behind tools that you're given uh, without understanding what went into them. So for instance, if, if the curriculum teaches that there are special kinds of triangles and they have these uh, long names from the Greek, equilateral, isosceles, and so on. Uh, students may have a hard time remembering what they mean. But if instead of defining these things in, in text and uh, drilling them and drilling students with them in, in testing, um, if you have the students explore the dependencies of triangles. So a triangle just has three sides. That's the de definition of triangle. Now you could have two sides being equal to each other. You could have all three sides being equal. You can have no sides being equal. You can look at the angles and say all three angles are the same, or two of the angles are the same, or none of the angles are the same. There are the, those different possibilities. And so if you just have ex students explore the different possible combinations, rather than telling them that there are a couple a couple of these combinations are uh, the ones that they have to remember. Um, then it's a different ex learning experience for them. So here's, a, here's an example of a curriculum unit. It just says, take turns dragging each vertex of each triangle. Can you tell what constraints each of these triangles was constructed with? And which of the triangles can be dynamically dragged to match which other ones? In particular, can poly one match all the others? Does everyone on the team agree about the matches? So you can, uh, you can try dragging some of these. And you can see, um, like this one, if you drag it all around, you might notice that uh, side DE is always equal to side DF. So this is a triangle that's built with a dependency that two of the sides are equal to each other. Uh, if you drag this one, you might decide that all three sides are always equal no matter how, how you drag it around. Uh, and, and so on, you might find that this one always has a right angle triangle, a right angle in it. Hmm? 
uh, and, and that this one is, is completely free uh, and in fact can correspond to any of the others. So you can sort of lay it on top of any of the other triangles, drag it to be equilateral, or you can drag it to be a right angle triangle. Oh, I think I. I think I dragged the wrong one. and so on. So you see that uh, a kind of generic triangle with no constraints built into it here um, can correspond to any of the others. And the students can, in a group can take turns doing that and exploring the dependencies. And then at a later lesson, they can start to create their own triangles that have similar dependencies built into them. So it's a more, exper a more um, experiential approach. So here's a, here's a triangle, just a, a generic triangle. And I've constructed the in-center of the triangle. Point D is the in-center such that a, um, a circle around center D that touches one point will be inscribed inside of that triangle. No matter how the triangle changes, uh, the circle is always inscribed in there. <clears throat> now, often this, this is presented as a surprise. Aren't you surprised that uh, given a triangle that has no dependencies itself, that can be any shape, where you can drag any of the points, um, that even though the triangle itself has no, de no special dependencies, there you can discover a point within, within inside of that triangle that will be the center of a circle that is tangent to all three sides of the triangle, no matter how you change. And you can see that it remains that way no matter how you change uh, the triangle, how you drag it. Um, and uh, this, is, this is often presented as a mystery. How can this, and there's a number of characteristics of this point D uh, that are presented as a mystery to be proven. Now, how would you prove that this is true? Uh, and, and then for more advanced uh, students of geometry, there's a discovery made by the mathematician Euler called Euler's segment uh, that was discovered much later than Euclid that has a, that's presented in a similar way as a, a mystery that any a trying a generic triangle like this has this very complicated relationships among different kinds of centers of the triangle. And I want to present um, okay, and so the conjecture about the in-center goes like this, that there are five uh, surprising facts about it. Um, so first of all, you create this in-center by taking the bisectors of the angles. So you bisect angle A, angle B, and angle C, and Surprisingly, they all come together at one point. The three bisectors all come together at one point, and that, that 
is the point D. Um, furthermore, this point D is always located inside of the triangle. It never occurs outside the triangle, which other things that are called centers of triangles sometimes occur outside, but this is always found inside of the triangle. Uh, <clears throat> furthermore, if you draw a perpendicular from point D uh, to, to one of the sides, like here, here, and here, um, there all, all those perpendiculars are going to be the same length. And the circle, like I said, um, will pass through a point on, on the triangle and be tangent to the triangle at those points. Um, so this illustrates it, and, and here you can see um, uh, these pink lines are the bisectors of the three angles, and they all meet at point D. And here are the perpendiculars to the sides, uh, and they're all radii of the circle, so they're all the same length. And since they're perpendiculars to the sides, they're, uh, these points are tangents of the lines to the, to the triangles. <clears throat> so if you use the... Um, standard tools of GeoGebra um, to create the, uh, the in-center, point D, it remains a mystery why all these things are true about the in-center. But if instead of that, we use the basic tools of construction of um, a straight edge and compass, you can see in the construction process how all of these things follow from the dependencies that are constructed into it. Um, it's a little complicated, so here's, here's an example. Um, and the do dotted lines are various circles that are constructed to actually construct the, um, the bisectors of each of the angles. So there's about uh, 60 objects that are involved here, geometric objects, and they're all dependent so that if you move one point, everything moves around. But you see that the colored in relationships of the location of the in, in center and the radii that are tangent uh, tangential points of the circle, inscribed circle. All re those, those things all remain, um, those relationships all still hold as you, as you drag uh, the circle around. And the reason they hold is because of all these different dependencies ha that have been built in from the construction. And um, if, you've, if you've done the construction yourself and understood what you were doing, then you can explain uh, the di these five different points uh, that seemed mysterious. You can explain them based on uh, how it was constructed. And so you've already understood the proof, essentially the proof, and you can um, piece together the proof out of the dependencies that were built into the construction. Uh, and this just shows, through, shows um, <clears throat> how um, let's see. Yeah. Uh, shows here how uh, the angle bisector was constructed. Here, um, so you see that it's always a, it's always equidistant from the two sides, and and so that 
um, when you find the in-center and you drop the perpendicular, it's always going to be the same distance from this side as from this side. And by constructing this one, you know it's the same distance from this side and this side, and from here, this side and this side. So you know that all of those three um, perpendiculars from here are going to be equal because that's how you constructed the, the bisectors and, and so on. So it, it all um, follows from that kind of construction. Which is what this says. And then that's, this here has 63 objects in it. Um, so it, it's confusing when you see the whole thing, but if you've constructed it yourself, uh, then you see, uh, you see what the dependencies are that have been built into the construction. Um, and then you can abstract these and you can, you can save this as this whole process as a tool, a custom tool that creates an in-center. And, uh, and then you don't have to go through this whole process each time you want to create an, to create an in-center. Um, and then for, for Euler's, um, what, what Euler did then was to look at not only the in-center, but these other centers, the orthocenter, the centroid, and the circumcenter. And he discovered that they're collinear. And if you make this segment, which is called Euler's segment, from the orthocenter to the circumcenter, the centroid is always on that line. And if you find, compute the midpoint of that line segment uh, and you draw the circle, the circle goes through nine points that have different significance in the construction. <coughs> and um, so if we, if we drag this triangle, you see that those points all are always lined up collinear. Sometimes some of them even go outside of the triangle, like the circumcenter isn't necessarily inside can go outside and the orthocenter can also go outside of the triangle. But, there, but the centroid is always on the segment that connects them. So <clears throat> this is often presented also as a kind of mystery. So if you look at, for instance, um, If you look at a lot, most presentations of Euler's segment and of this nine-point circle, it's often present, it's usually presented as a mystery and then a complicated proof procedure to try to explain it. But um, similarly to the uh, <clears throat> to the incenter. Um, similarly to the in-center, you can see that it's, um, it's a result of the construction and of the dependencies that were built into constructing these different centers. Um, <clears throat> And we can see that in, uh, in, in the proof. So here's the um, circumcenter, orthocenter, and, and, in, and centroid. And if we move the triangle around, they always stay collinear. And if we drop, um, so the, the the circumcenter here, point O, was constructed using these perpendicular bisectors. 
Um, so if we draw that perpendicular bisector in, and the orthocenter was constructed using altitude, so if we draw in the altitude, we get these two similar triangles, and using the similarity of those triangles, we can show that this length is always twice as long as this length, which is one of the uh, uh, mysteries of the Euler segment. Uh, and so the, the, proof, the proof that of these characteristics of the Euler segment um, are based on the way that these different, in center, these different centers of the triangle were constructed, that they were constructed in terms of the medians, altitudes, or perpendicular bisectors. Um, <clears throat> so the, the point, the only point that I want to make is that uh, to, if you understand the dependencies that are built in in this construction, then that leads you to the, to the proof. It gives you the understanding you need to develop, uh, to develop the proof. And the, and the reason I think this is important is because if you think of these things as mysteries that have to be proven by some um, proofs that come from an authority like Euclid or Euler, then um, it's, it's not your own. You don't have a sense that, this, that you've created this knowledge, that you've created these things. But if, if, you, if you understand these things as results of the construction that you did as somebody creating these, constructing these uh, different kinds of points and constructing these different dependencies into the construction, then you have a sense of empowerment that, that these uh, interesting facts about geometry are things that were created, uh, discovered, a combination of discovery and creation by your team working together collaboratively to, uh, to accomplish this. And so uh, I consider that a creative discovery approach, a human-centered approach to, to mathematics. It's kind of a philosophy of mathematics, that mathematics doesn't exist out in some kind of platonic uh, ideal universe that's completely divorced from our own world, but rather that it's, it's like other forms of knowledge, it's socially constructed by a community. And that community dates all the way back to the early Greek geometers and Euclid and so on. But it also includes uh, myself and my classmates and our team working together and creating these constructions that have these features, that have these dependencies that we've try, decided and designed into the figures. And dynamic geometry software provides the opportunity to combine this discovery and creation. And the discovery takes place primarily through dragging figures around, and the creation takes place primarily through construction of dependencies. The discovery is discovering dependencies that are in figures, and the creation is creating dependencies that you want to design into the feature, into the figures. So this is one of my favorite um, curriculum topics. So we get, I give the students this figure here, and don't really tell them anything about it except to explore it. Take turns dragging uh, vertex A and vertex D of the interior triangle. And chat, a chat about the dependencies you notice. And then reconstruct this figure yourself to have the same behavior. And so it combines the discovery through dragging with the creation through 
uh, construction of dependencies. So if I drag point A, so what, what do you observe dragging point A? What kind of triangle does that look like? The larger triangle. Equilateral, Equilateral. very good. And <laughs> there's our star, our star mathematician. Uh, and if I drag Point D, what kind of triangle looks, does the in interior one look like? It's also equilateral, it looks like. Uh, and furthermore, it's always inscribed in the larger triangle, never gets outside of it, can get as big as it, can get much smaller. Um, and is there anything else you notice as I drag this? that might be useful in when you want to construct this figure yourself. So what, I'm moving point D here. What, what else moves when I move point D? E and F move. And what, what can you say about how they move? Right, exactly. So th their movement is dependent upon uh, D. So for instance, if D starts all the way in one vertex there, and then, I'm, then E and F are also at, at their corresponding vertices. And as I move across to the opposite one, uh, e and F move to their opposite one. Always move correspondingly. And there's a tool in GeoGebra called the compass tool, which becomes very handy here. So if I measure measure this distance here from C to D, and then I move that distance over to point A, I'll find that point E is right at that intersection. And similarly, if I measure that distance and move it to point B, I'll see that point F is at the intersection. So that, that dependency that points E and F are always equal distant from their vertex, vertex to the distance from C to D is critical to reconstructing this figure. The students already know how to build an equilateral triangle. They learned that from uh, their first lesson from Euclid. So that's easy, but how to build the interior equilateral triangle is very tricky and sort of requires you to see this relationship. But you can discover this relationship through the dragging. And then once you've discovered that, and you know how to use this um, compass tool, then it's not that difficult to recreate the figure and build in those same dependencies and relationships. So um, the, to me, this is, I use this as my examination of groups of students using GeoGebra. Uh, when I first came across this, it took me a few days to figure out how to do it. I have to admit, on my own. And, uh, and we give students, groups of students, an hour to work on this. And, and I feel that if a, if a group uh, is able to accomplish this in an hour, they're doing a pretty good job. They've learned quite a bit about exploring uh, these figures and building in dependencies. And I've seen, uh, uh, we'll see tomorrow when I analyze uh, the log of three 14-year-old um, girls who had never studied geometry before, after a couple lessons in GeoGebra, are able to accomplish this together. They wouldn't have been able, none of them could possibly have done it by themselves. 
but as a collaborative group, they were able to accomplish this. And also groups of teachers can often accomplish this in an hour as a collaborative group, and they realized that they couldn't, could never also have accomplished it individually. So this is kind of a test. That's the way I like to test collaborative groups, is to give them a challenging problem like this and see, see how they do on it. Uh, and, then, and then I have a, a, a generalization of this. So first, after I do the, tr the inscribed triangles, I give them inscribed squares. And inscribed squares, once you've caught on to this uh, trick that the, they move the, cor the inside figure moves the corresponding way of the outside figure so that this distance is always equal to this distance and this distance and so on. It's easy to generalize to um, polygons with more sides. And then you can even prove it for an n-sided polygon in general pretty easily once you understand this dependency that you've figured out with the inscribed triangles. And <clears throat> so, uh, so once we have this curriculum developed, uh, then we've tried it with uh, professional development for teachers. And um, so right now we have a, a group of teachers going through the curriculum. Uh, they'll be spending a semester on it. So that's uh, uh, 15 weeks, I think. And each week they'll be doing one or two of these uh, curriculum units that go through several GeoGebra tabs. And they do a little bit of reading about dynamic geometry and using uh, dynamic geometry in the classroom and about collaborative learning and math discourse. And they also reflect on their problem solving, collaborative problem solving. Um, And, and then in, uh, once the teachers are finished the course, then they'll pre present uh, similar topics to their students in their classrooms. And they'll continue um, to reflect on how, then how their students are doing uh, back with the other teachers. So, the approach that we use uh, stresses collaborative learning, first of all. So almost the vast majority of the GeoGebra work is done in small groups. Um, we stress their discourse, uh, how, how to um, develop a better significant math discourse. Uh, and the focus in a lot of the geometry tasks is on constructing dependencies. Uh, so it's a, a very hands-on, student-centered, uh, but guided by these, these very brief um, um, tasks to do in GeoGebra. And the tasks uh, emphasize the combination of exploration through dragging and design through construction. So this combination of a creative discovery approach to mathematics. And I tried to use uh, the full power of GeoGebra, not, not in the sense of including advanced trigonometry or calculus or anything, but using the, having the students involved in doing their own constructions, uh, teaching them how to use, create custom tools, uh, rather than using it just as a way for teachers to illustrate things to the students. Uh, and then by you having the, ch the collaborative chat rooms uh, and the logs available to students and teachers and researchers um, to promote reflection 
on what they've accomplished, uh, the history of their work together. And we tune the curriculum uh, to the audience, whether it's uh, math teachers or uh, young students or more advanced students. Um, so la last spring we had uh, eight sessions for um, I think about a hundred students and uh, some of those student groups were in classrooms, some were after school and some the students even worked from at home in the evenings but they all had to be on the computer at the same time as the other people in their group uh, and to stay in there for about an hour each, uh, each session. Uh, and since it's all on the internet, it's even possible uh, to have student teams in different schools working. So, uh, a student from one school, a student from a second school, and a student from a third school, all being in the same group um, and working together. So they'd be working with students that they don't know on a face-to-face -face basis, which uh, might be interesting for them. Uh, and then, uh, since it's a research project, uh, we do research and we analyze um, the interactions that take place, and we'll be doing some of that tomorrow at the data session. Uh, and I've looked, um, been looking especially at one team uh, of students during the spring who, uh, who did a very nice job and uh, were awarded the prize for the most collaborative group in that session. Um, but the software gives us complete logging of, of the interactions, both in um, spreadsheet format and a replayer uh, presentation. Uh, and my, the curriculum is, is available. Uh, this is the curriculum, at least the, uh, pretty much how it was used last, last spring. Uh, so all of the different um, GeoGebra sessions are in here and also uh, tutorials uh, about how to use the software, uh, both the virtual math team software and the uh, GeoGebra and so on. So I think that's, uh, that's about it. I, I've written three books about the research. Um, Back uh, when we were just starting the project in 2006, uh, I wrote a book called Group Cognition about how groups work together. And then in 2009, uh, a number of people, not just me, but other people associated more or less with the work with the research group, uh, also some people from other parts of the world who have used VMT, uh, wrote some chapters analyzing. And just recently, uh, this spring, I published this um, translating Euclid, which gives a, a rather full um, presentation of our research project from many different angles and dimensions. So uh, in addition to a lot of conference papers and so on, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of research literature now on this project. And <clears throat> so this information is available. Uh, here's the slides from today that I presented today and the different books. And this is where you can download uh, this topic's workbook. <clears throat>